Today begins the first interview of WILL's World War II project to capture and preserve the memories of soldiers and civilians in Illinois during that period. My name is Harriet Williamson. I am a producer with WILL AM radio. In charge of lighting sound and the camera is Julius Bolton. Today is Thursday, July 19, 2007, and this interview is recorded in WILL's Campbell Hall on the campus of the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. It is my honor and privilege to be talking with Ralph Wagner Woolard, a veteran of the European theater of World War II. And in the studio is Mr. Woolard's wife of 59 years, Wilma Lee Broughton Woolard, and uh, Elif Bashar, heading WILL's Oral History Project, is also with us here in the studio. Uh, Mr. Woolard, before we talk about your military experiences, could you um, tell us about your background? Yes. <clears throat> I was born in Cowden, Illinois on June 6, 1924. Uh, I was born into a uh, family uh, that uh, basically uh, followed agriculture. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side was a farmer. On my father's side, uh, farming had occupied the family for some time, but also uh, they followed carpentry as a skill and, a, and as a means of employment. We, uh, my father and, uh, in growing up, uh, I was privileged to have very loving parents, people who uh, spend a lot of time with us, both, both my brother and I. I have one brother who is uh, two years younger. We uh, spent a lot of time with my uh, grandparents during the summer, enjoyed it very much and uh, developed a keen interest in uh, the lives of uh, my grandparents and the associated uh, um, uh, people who lived around uh, the general area of Shelby County. We, uh, my brother and I, uh, very early uh, developed an interest in reading and uh, this was prompted, I think, uh, by my mother, who uh, had graduated from a high school, which was a bit unusual at the time. She graduated when she was 16 and was offered a scholarship to what at the time was Illinois State Normal University. But being 16 years of, old, of age, her parents felt that I was a bit young to leave home. And uh, my father, on the other hand, uh, had been put to work at the age, well, he finished eighth grade and then was put to work with uh, neighboring farmers to help with the livelihood of the total family. He uh, was also quite interested in education and uh, had he had the privilege of uh, going to school longer, he would have... Uh, augured well for him. Mm. We uh, uh, lived in Hillsboro, uh, Illinois, for the first six years of uh, my life. In uh, Hillsboro, I started to elementary school. And at that time, at the age of six, the Great Depression was just beginning. Uh, my father had worked uh, at the glass company in Hillsboro. It closed at the beginning of the Depression. At the uh, close of the uh, glass company, my father was out of work for well over a year. He uh, traveled all over the state trying to get something to do. Shuck corn in northern Illinois, sold newspapers, 
did what he could to keep the family uh, together. At, <clears throat> I well remember uh, the effect of uh, the uh, those years on both uh, my family and the family of some of my cousins. Uh, and I'll go into that in a moment. But at the close of the glass company and being out of work, my father looked to the glass company in Alton, Illinois, one that was still functioning. It was the world's largest glass company. And they had just installed new equipment, equipment that the fa factory in Hillsboro had. And uh, my father knew that they would need operators for this new equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, they found out about my father, they called him, and uh, he had a job for the rest of the Depression, in fact, for the rest of his life. My father was an insistent man. He wanted more than anything else that his sons get an education, a college education, and uh, he worked uh, diligently to see that happen. It uh, finally did happen after uh, World War, at the end of World War II. Uh, I had developed uh, in high school an interest in uh, history, and I wanted to be a teacher. This was prompted pretty largely by a high school teacher that I had, a man by the name of Harlow, very good teacher, and uh, took an interest in me. And uh, uh, following the war, I <clears throat> went to college and then eventually to the university and uh, getting a master's degree from Washington University in St. Louis, a degree in education and uh, uh, educational administration and a, a degree also a uh, master of arts in history. So uh, uh, education has been a large part of uh, my life, um, my brother's life as well. Uh, he <clears throat> eventually wound up graduating from Harvard. Uh, <clears throat> he followed a military career f for his entire life, becoming a commander of the Green Beret operation mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Uh, <clears throat> I had no interest in being in the military, but I uh, did have an interest in teaching. And uh, after the war, I uh, got my first job in uh, McLean County as a junior high school teacher. And uh, was very privileged to serve under a uh, superintendent who I admired greatly. He, uh, it was a small district, about 100 square miles, and uh, he uh, showed me the paces of what it means to be a, a principal, a teacher, a principal, and eventually a superintendent. Mm -hmm. And I've been all three. Then I went on to teach at uh, Bradley University for about six years. Uh, <clears throat> coming back now, uh, we, at the uh, beginning of World War II, I can well remember when it started for me. I was in working in a theater. I was in high school, and uh, uh, suddenly they flashed on the, sh the uh, movie screen. Uh, something I'd never seen there before. The operator had stopped the uh, uh, projectors and had inserted a slide which had said, we are at war with Japan. Mm. It was on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, that uh, piqued my interest and curiosity. Uh, uh, I graduated from high school 
in uh, 1943, January of 1943, a mid-year graduation. I knew that uh, I would be drafted. I uh, also uh, decided that uh, I would try to take a month or a month and a half and work for somebody to establish a relationship with some industry, for example, the glass factory. Uh, that you never know what turn the economy is going to take. And if you have a relationship with an industry, you might uh, get a job after mm -hmm. the war. Mm -hmm. At least, and this is what my father uh, suggested to me. But uh, uh, in April of uh, 1970, or 1943, I was drafted. And... I was sent to Scott Air Force Base in uh, East St. Louis, or near East St. Louis. And uh, there I was given a battery of tests of all kinds. Uh, and I was a bit surprised at this. I thought that uh, probably you're just taken in and slapped into a unit and away mm -hmm. you go. But uh, it was a rather extensive battery of tests at the conclusion of which I uh, was called in by a, to a counselor's office and he asked me uh, about some of my interests and he said, well, I can, uh, I'll let you go two ways. He said, uh, we can put you into some kind of office work in the Army <clears throat> or you can go into infantry intelligence. Now, I didn't know what infantry intelligence was. I had an idea of what infantry was, but intelligence uh, was an alien field to me. Had I known what it would eventually entail, I might have changed my mind. <laughs> but uh, I said I'll take intelligence because I didn't want to st uh, just stay in the, an office during this war. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was put into uh, training in infantry intelligence, sent to uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama uh, as for basic training, 16 weeks. It was an interesting 16 weeks. We, uh, uh, <clears throat> we were trained. Uh, extensively, although I must say not given very adequate training in the field of intelligence, but well, awful lot, an awful lot in infantry. Um, we lived in barracks, uh, wooden barracks, 25, 30 men in a barracks. We, uh, uh, it was hot and uh, Sometimes it was so hot and humid that tempers would be a bit, a bit short. But uh, I had a great deal of admiration for some of the trainers, the uh, permanent cadre at the, uh, at Fort McClellan. I recall the, one of them very well. He was our uh, platoon leader, and uh, he was a tough guy. His name was Huff. And he had five brothers who were also in the cadre in Fort McClellan. And he told us that if any of us got out of line and he couldn't put us in line, he had five brothers who would help him. <laughs> and, uh, but he was an extremely fair man. And uh, if you got chewed out, you deserved it. And he chewed me out a couple of times, and I deserved it. But... Uh, a, a very good man for training. Uh, the people in the uh, intelligence group were very interesting. A lot of, uh, a lot of college fellows and uh, bright young men. At the same time, in uh, barracks across the street, there were uh, men who were studying coding. That uh, there's a lot of code work in the Army, and it takes a very keen, uh, smart person to be in that particular section. You have uh, 
and machines that help you code code uh, messages, but there's also w other work involved. But, uh, <clears throat> I, I recall also that uh, in my particular platoon, there was a tackle from the University of Mississippi, a tackle from the University of Louisiana. There was a fellow who played professional football with the old Chicago Cardinals. He was a, a, a guard. I met him after the war under very unusual circumstances. Uh, and they're all uh, good people. I, uh, at the conclusion of our basic training, they went various directions. Uh, we all went uh, different ways. But uh, occasionally uh, I would hear f of one or two of them. Most of them, unfortunately, did not make it through the war. Uh, we had excellent food. I had uh, always interested in the southern boys and what they called uh, some of the dishes that we had. If we drank milk, it was always sweet milk. Mm. You had some sweet milk, and that was. And we also had coffee milk. It's the first time I'd ever have that. First time I ever had honeydew melon. Mm. Uh, and I found out very quickly that uh, army cooks are not to be messed with. They are the king of the kitchen. And if you go in, you better have a good reason to be there. They were, I uh, had many occasions to have run-ins with an uh, army cook. And uh, there was always uh, a different kind of a thrill. <laughs> um, 16 weeks was all they were allowed for basic training. All, that's all you would get. There was no further training for the intelligence uh, section. Uh, at the end of that period, we could elect, if we wished to, to go into the paratroops. And uh, I don't like to climb ladders even, so mm -hmm. I didn't go that direction. So that was the end of training? There was no advanced training after that? That was it. That was it. Do you mm -hmm. feel that that training was adequate for preparing you for what you met when you were in battle? Not really. Uh, no. And uh, the battlefield experience, I found, was a bit different than what they were telling us at Fort McClellan. Mm -hmm. For example, at Fort McClellan, they uh, taught us map reading uh, using aerial photographs. And we had aer <coughs> aerial photograph training and uh, looking at those photographs through a little magnifier. We never had a photograph all during war. Uh, my, uh, my squad never had a photograph all through the war. Mm -hmm. Never had occasion. And uh, other things, other experiences like that. We, uh, at the end of the 16-week period, we got one week at home, mm -hmm. and uh, that was pure joy. I got all the cake I could eat. <laughs> we uh, then went, I had to report to uh, the East Coast, and uh, we uh, went to New Jersey, and then to... Uh, a loading dock on the coast where we got on what were called, uh, well, there were troop ships. They were sometimes called the victory ship. Mm -hmm. They had been mass produced uh, during the early part of the uh, war. At what point did you know where you were going, or did you not know? Uh, we, we didn't know mm -hmm. when we got on the boat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it soon became apparent from the uh, sailors on the boat that they knew pretty well where we were going. And these, uh, when I say sailors, I, uh, there were more merchant mar mariners on there than, uh, than uh, mm -hmm. U.S. Army or U.S. 
sailors. And they weren't uh, at all uh, hesitant uh, to tell you where you, they think you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there were at least uh, a thousand men on the ship that we were on. We were uh, bunked in a hold deep in the bowels of the boat. And the uh, <clears throat> Uh, sleeping arrangements. We were cramped together. There were bunk after bunk, five bunks high, and an aisle about that wide between the bunks. I slept in my bunk one night. It took uh, 12 days to get across the Atlantic. I slept there one night and decided I didn't want any more of that. <clears throat> so I took my blanket and went up and slept in an aisleway in the middle of the ship, mm -hmm. just on a piece of iron, and uh, that's where I spent the nights. And, uh, most of the men uh, got ill, seasick, terrible mess. The urinals all full, the boat would rock and it was stormy. Mm -hmm and the urinals would splash out, and it was just <clears throat> terrible to uh, try to live in. I became ill with the rest, and uh, about the time I was getting better, I went and got a, some food in the chow line and took it to the edge, or uh, took it uh, up on the deck, and there was an upper deck above me. And I was just ready to eat when the fellow above me, he lost all of his cookies <laughs> and right in my mess kit. And uh, I went without food for another few days. <laughs> it was, uh, there was nothing to do. There was no planned entertainment. Uh, with what, uh, what I found some fellows were doing, uh, they had a quarter or usually a quarter and I'd take a spoon and begin hammering away on this quarter and then making a ring or making a piece of jewelry out of it. It's just something to do, mm -hmm. something to do. The uh, course uh, and direction of the boats changed about every half hour. We were escorted, now there were several of these boats in our uh, um, convoy. About every half hour, the direction would change because uh, the destroyers, uh, well, the destroyers were really in command. And uh, they would give a signal, and all the boats would turn a different direction. We were trying to avoid uh, attack by submarine. Mm -hmm. Then half an hour would go another direction. And that's the reason it took so long to get across. Um, we landed in Casablanca, Morocco, but uh, simply to load on uh, trucks and uh, went to a freight station or a railroad station. The railroad station, uh, I quickly noted, uh, were narrow gauge railroads. Now, the uh, meaning by that that the rails are closer together than on Mm -hmm. American railroads. Uh, the rail cars, box cars, were about half the size of the American box car. We were loaded uh, into those uh, box cars, about 18 men to a car, and uh, we headed uh, out uh, and we felt by this time that we all knew that we were going to uh, 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 go to uh, Oran, Africa. It was the only logical point that we could go to. And uh, it was a beautiful country. Uh, the Atlas Mountains of northeastern or northwestern Africa are gorgeous. And uh, the valleys were full of citrus fruits citrus or orchards. We uh, 
took about a, almost a week to get to Oran. Uh, <clears throat> On the, on the way, we ate uh, uh, from cans, canned rations. That's all we had. And uh, we had some coffee that uh, we could make. We had <clears throat> each one of the uh, boxcars had a little uh, makeshift stove that we could heat things on. So we uh, got to Oran, or the outskirts of Oran. We took uh, about four or five days to uh, do some forced marches. To uh, we'd been on a boat and we'd been on this train and we needed mm -hmm. to loosen up and get toughened up again. So we went on forced marches, which were uh, rather deadly. They were, I recall, <clears throat> over half the men would fall out on those marches, and uh, I never fell out, but I. Felt like doing it sometimes. Mm -hmm. We uh, <clears throat> then at, at this point, we were loaded on uh, small boats, across the Mediterranean, landing at Naples, Italy, passing the Isle of Capri as we went into the harbor. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to pause here for a moment and just give you a thumbnail sketch of those geographic areas on mm -hmm. which I served. Of course, Africa. And by the way, uh, while I was in uh, North Africa, just for those four or five days, I happened to see an auction at which uh, a woman was sold for, I don't know how many goats or a camel or something. Mm. That sort of thing was still going on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, all right, back to the, the geography. It was in North Africa, uh, Italy. From Italy, uh, went to France. From France into the Alsace, Alsace uh, area between Germany and uh, France. Went into Germany. At the end of the war, I was deep into Austria. That's where I was when the war ended. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> now, in uh, Naples, we were uh, given uh, some clean equipment, clean clothes. We were uh, uh, given shots, uh, various uh, prevent various diseases. We uh, had a little entertainment while we were there. I recall that Joe Lewis, the uh, boxer, heavyweight champ, came in and gave a boxing exhibition mm. one night, and uh, it was quite a thrill to see him. Mm. He was quite a man. Uh, in, in a few days, we were told that we would be going up and joining our division. A division, as you may know, is a, about 16,000 strong men. A division has three regiments. Uh, each regiment uh, uh, for example, the regiment uh, regiments that I uh, were in were in the 36th Infantry Division. I belonged to the 142nd Regiment. There was 141st, 142nd, 143rd. Uh, and each regiment has a series of battalions, uh, and uh, three battalions. Each battalion has four companies. Each company has about four platoons of 30 to 40 men each. Mm -hmm. And that then there are other uh, uh, units that are attached now and then. 
we occasionally would be, we would have an attachment from uh, an artillery unit or a medical unit. Uh, depending on the circumstances, the need for uh, support, the need for uh, medical attention, etc. And um, the Army uh, today still has divisions, but the divisions are structured somewhat differently. Uh, there's been a lot of changes, and much of it is very debatable mm -hmm. in the past couple, three years. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Naples, I was told I would uh, be assigned to the 36th Infantry Division. Uh, I knew that the 36th Infantry Division uh, had been on the initial landing in uh, Italy. Winston Churchill had uh, insisted with, uh, to Eisenhower that we attack what Winston Churchill called the soft underbelly of Europe. And uh, it turned out not to be... He's going to change the tape. All right. You were talking about Winston Churchill. Yes, he was uh, insistent that there be some uh, action in uh, southern Europe. And uh, the 36th Infantry Division was uh, elected, so to speak, to be the spearhead division to land in Italy. And uh, on September 9th, 1943. Uh, the 36 landed uh, on the beach at uh, Salerno Bay. They almost got bi uh, got pushed off the beach. It was uh, 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 <clears throat> just to back up a moment. The German commanders were very keen. I think the best commander of all the generals in uh, Italy was the German commander, Kesselring. He was very, very able. Now, we had better commanders than he uh, eventually, but uh, in, uh, in Italy, we suffered occasionally from lack of leadership. I'm not saying that as uh, from my own standpoint, but what I read from military historians and others. <coughs> uh, <coughs> well, September 9th, the landing took place. Uh, the Germans had very superior uh, tank equipment, and uh, they almost pushed us off the beach. Uh, I was, of course, not with the unit yet, and uh, I'll get to that, but uh, from those uh, men who were there, the only thing that saved us was they took our, what uh, we called our 105 millimeter howitzers. It's a good big round shell. It's never meant for direct fire. It's meant to lob shells over. The Germans were so close from here to that wall over there, that uh, they had to use uh, their 105 millimeter howitzers to blow up the German tanks. And they would blow the, the tanks out of the water, but uh, that was the only thing that saved the 36th Infantry Division. And once they had that settled, uh, they began pushing uh, on north. And I'll come to where I joined the division here shortly. Uh, in Naples, uh, again, we uh, it was raining most of the time. It was a miserable place to be. We were in what was called uh, Mussolini's uh, uh, sports arena. And it was a huge arena, <coughs> big flat area in the middle where we had tents. 
it, uh, as I said, was raining a good part of the time. Uh, I, uh, along with uh, the other people in the tent I was in, we had a little free time and we walked around Naples. Uh, Naples isn't the most attractive city in the world. Uh, and uh, some very uh, large slum areas uh, to the city. Although you get to a certain section on the north end uh, where some of the richer people live, uh, there is some very beautiful homes and buildings. We, uh, uh, the 36th Division went from Salerno up the Italian peninsula and uh, they had to fight their way all the way up and <clears throat> eventually came to a town by the name of San Pietro. San Pietro is a town of maybe 10,000 people, Italians. Uh, and <clears throat> our, uh, I still was not with the uh, unit as yet, but uh, the division had the job of uh, running over that town and chasing the Germans out. And uh, they eventually did, but with a staggering loss of men. And by the way, this eventually became the subject of uh, perhaps the best war picture to come out of World War II. It's called San Pietro. Hmm. And uh, the book I provided you has a few pictures of mm -hmm. San Pietro in it. I recall uh, talking after I joined the unit. I recall talking to a squad leader who had uh, been observing the town as uh, the town was attacked. He was observing it through uh, uh, glasses, uh, field glasses. And he was watching two men. One was a German soldier. One was an American soldier. And <clears throat> one was going down one street, the other street. They saw one another at the same time. They each pulled the trigger about the same time. They both were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a strange coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I joined the 36th Division in December of 1943. Um, about December 23rd, the uh, division had still been in combat every day. Now, now they were pulled off, or a, a few at a time were pulled off to rest for two days and to get replacements because we were in, they were desperately in need of replacements. Mm -hmm. It was raining all day on the 23rd of December. I, it was about dusk when I arrived at the division by uh, Jeep. I met uh, the first sergeant of the company. He's a man that, that uh, I, he's a man of about uh, uh, 39, 40. And uh, I grew to respect him greatly. And he lived through the war. I was glad to, to uh, glad that he did. He was the guy that held the company together. You know, they can say all they want about the, the officers, the captains, and the majors, mm -hmm. and so on. But you've got to have a good first sergeant. What, what was it that he did that kept everyone together? What? Uh, <clears throat> Extreme fairness. Uh, if you had to go on patrol, which is a dirty job, the next patrol that went out, you didn't have to go. You mm -hmm. know, he divided the work. He uh, assigned responsibilities. If you had a sector that you were going to defend, you know, he made sure that you had the equipment and uh, the manpower to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> It was just a, 
very even-tempered man, mm -hmm. very even-tempered. But when he spoke, you know, you better listen. So I, I really respected him. Now he was a member, I, I should tell you this, the 36th Division was a Texas division. It was a Texas National Guard. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old timers in it were Texans, cowboys, some of them were half Indian. Had a fellow by the name of Lightfoot who was mostly Indian. But uh, um, the, the first sergeant was uh, was a Texan. Now uh, it didn't make any difference. He didn't favor the Texans over the other guys. Well, December twenty third, I joined. The division. He took me around, introduced me to the intelligence squad. I was eager to see what these fellows looked like. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were dug in uh, at the base of a little hill. And there were only about eight of them left and uh, out of a squad of 12. So uh, they introduced me. Um, and I was left to my own devices after that. What am, what am I going to do? Am I going to dig a hole or what, what am I to do? Uh, I got no direction there at, at that particular point. But there was uh, another young fellow who uh, joined the unit. His name was Dean Steele. And he was going to join the radio section. He was a radio operator. And... Uh, so he was at loose ends. We put our shelter halves together, farmed a tent, plopped down in a muddy field, muddy field and slept all night. Got up the next morning to the sound of uh, one of the Texans singing, Oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> and it was still raining. Uh, that was, we woke up on the 24th. We moved a mile closer to the front. We uh, bivouacked, or uh, we put up a little tent and dug a hole. I was still with Dean Steele. Uh, we were very close to this artillery unit, and uh, the artillery men didn't stop for Christmas. They just kept firing and firing, and, and uh, it was uh, outgo what we call outgoing uh, uh, ammo. So, uh, on the 25th, we went up on the line, the front line. We went up and relieved uh, elements of the 3rd Infantry Division, which was uh, a very good uh, division. We, uh, as we went up, uh, Sergeant Smith, who was the intelligence squad uh, sergeant, took me aside and he said, you're going to be with me. And uh, he took me under his wing. Uh, we got to the top of this hill uh, overlooking a huge valley. And uh, he said, you dig in with me. I'll show you how to dig a good foxhole. Uh, <clears throat> Sergeant Smith probably saved my life mm. because uh, He taught me you know, the sound of different weaponry. German machine pistol has a certain sound. A German machine gun has a different sound. An 88 millimeter uh, German anti-tank uh, shell has a very distinctive sound. Uh, he taught me all those things. Mm -hmm. And they were critical to staying alive. Mm -hmm. uh, they got down to basics. Uh, if you're stuck in your foxhole and you can't get out because of enemy fire, how do you use the toilet? How what do you do with the waste? Can you stay in there and still live? It's uh, it was just basic kinds of uh, information. Well, uh, Smith was a very good soldier. 
uh, uh, but I'll tell you now that at a certain point, as we moved uh, on during the war, he became extremely nervous, and uh, the, the uh, pressure got to him, and uh, uh, he just kind of went to pieces. Uh, so he had to go, go back, and uh, never really saw him again. He we either went home or got some job in quartermaster or something. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> he was he was a very good man. Uh, the uh, work at that time, in some days, was humdrum. Uh, S2, uh, our intelligence uh, uh, squad, we did observation work. We had field glasses. Uh, this is just one aspect of the work. We kept our field glasses trained on across the valley. And we knew the Germans were entrenched on a hillside on Bia. We uh, watched very carefully, especially at night. Now, one of the skills that you learn is how to determine where an enemy piece of equipment is located, an artillery piece. There's a, a, a method called triangulation. And uh, I'm here on this outpost, and over here in another battalion is this S2 guy who's also watching. And uh, at night, you watch for gun flashes or artillery flashes out of the muzzle of a German gun. You take what's called an azimuth from the position of this man over here. He takes an uh, angular shot with his compass, and he's at a certain angle mm -hmm. from this man. I do the same thing. And, uh, and we also compute from the time of the flash till the artillery piece lands where you are, hopefully not right at you, but uh, at, a, at a point, and you know that it took two seconds or three seconds, and uh, you know that the muzzle velocity, velocity of an 88 millimeter gun is 2,700 feet per second. And you put all those factors together, and uh, even though that artillery piece may be behind a small mountain over there, you know pretty well where he's located. Mm -hmm. And you can begin to throw your own artillery uh, there. That's one aspect of our work. and. Uh, However, there were other uh, factors, or other uh, ways of getting intelligence. We also did patrol work. And this is the most dangerous of the work. We uh, went out on patrols at night with the intent of capturing enemy soldiers. If we didn't capture them, uh, at least got a hold of them. And uh, sometimes uh, we'd, off of a dead soldier, we'd get a piece of their uniform that showed their uh, division stripe or mm -hmm. their division symbol. If we were able to get a prisoner or two, uh, we would bring them back. Uh, my squad, we had uh, um, two men who spoke German, one man who spoke French, one man who spoke Italian. And between them, we could get some s conversation mm -hmm. going with this German soldier. And uh, that was, uh, we would talk with him, get as much as we could, and then send them on back to people who had more time to mm -hmm. do the talking, but it's a part of the intelligence picture. If the prisoner would talk and say how long his unit had been online, we knew that it was fresh, it was probably pretty tough. If they'd been on line for three weeks or four weeks, they might be tired and, and uh, mm -hmm. all those things. Are, you build a picture of mm -hmm. 
who's out there ahead of you. So <clears throat> that was another aspect of uh, of the uh, of the work, and one of the very important ones. There were perhaps even an even more deadly thing, and we didn't have to do it often because uh, our first sergeant uh, was uh, he was rather adamant about making people share the work. Uh, sometimes we'd have to go on a point. Now, a point means that uh, you're, uh, you're ready for an attack. You're going to attack a hill or a city. You, uh, you send out your point squad. Those are the first men to go. Now, the reason for using the intelligence squad occasionally for that was uh, uh, you drew the first fire. When you drew the first fire, you knew the position of some of the German machine guns, or perhaps you got around from an anti-tank weapon, uh, 88 millimeter. And uh, you quickly sized up what was out there and reported back and you could do that with radio. You reported back as what you saw and what you think you're faced with. So uh, then the company commander or the platoon uh, sergeant could uh, make some adjustments so he knew just mm -hmm. what his next step should be. But it's pretty dangerous uh, work. Uh, I was really on, on a point only two or three times. Um, and that was kind of the intelligence uh, operation. We, we did uh, uh, regular infantry work when it was uh, necessary and often was. In other words, when we're being attacked, you became a rifleman, you became a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifleman, uh, whatever weapon you had and you expected to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, uh, we had, uh, had joined the division, and the uh, 36th uh, Division was, uh, at this point, just below the town of Casino, Italy. Uh, most military historians say that the worst fighting uh, in World War II was a casino. Mm -hmm. Bar none, bar, even mm -hmm. the uh, D-Day was not as rough as the day after day grinding that you took at Casino. Casino was located at the base of a large mountain. And uh, it's a city today of probably 30 to 40,000 people. At that time, it was probably a little bit smaller, but most of the people were gone. Just above uh, the town, this mountain, and on the top of it was an abbey built in 1400 called Monte Cassino Abbey very famous abbey built by Benedictine monks. And uh, the feeling was that the Germans were using this abbey as an observation post. And the debate raged as to whether they were or they weren't, and if they were, what should we do about it? Well, <clears throat> Let me step back just a few days and give you some of the idea about the weather that we were in, uh, we were having. It was miserable at the, uh, uh, a miserable valley that, and mountains that we were in. We. Uh, the mud was ankle deep in the valleys. As you 
went up the mountains. Uh, sometimes it was raining, and as you got near the top, uh, the snow. And we often were in uh, uh, snowy areas. Um, frostbite was a real factor. I remember seeing men crawl down the side of the mountain to an aid station because their feet were so numb that they couldn't stand on them. They couldn't mm -hmm. feel their feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had to, at night, if you could, take your shoes off and rub your toes and keep them, keep some circulation. And I know I, I got frostbite, but I, I didn't have to go back uh, for it, but it uh, bothered me for a long time. Um, on one occasion, at the casino front, the Germans pushed through a group of Italians. Now, the Germans didn't want to take care of them. They said, let the Americans take care of them. They pushed them through the lines, and uh, they happened to come through uh, my platoon and company area. And these were men and women and children. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw two men without shoes. And it was snowing. We didn't have much we could give them mm -hmm. except to direct them on down to the base of the mountain. But uh, the civilians suffered, and uh, there's no question about it. The Italian people had very little stomach for that war. Mm -hmm. Mussolini was, they had little respect for him after the war started. We used the Italian soldiers as uh, uh, men to bring the uh, burrows up the side of the mountain with our ammunition and with our food. and. Uh, these burrows were brought in from Arkansas, and uh, they were very sturdy pack animals. The uh, Italian, thinking that these burrows were from the USA, they would get mad at them and try to curse them in English, <laughs> thinking <laughs> that the burrows could understand that a bit better. But. Uh, we were uh, given our food and daily rations by a steady supply of uh, food that came up by burrows most of the way. It was uh, coming up the mountains on the casino front, and the mountains that we occupied. Uh, it was a four-hour journey up and a four-hour mm -hmm. journey down. Uh, and the burrows could only go part way. We would meet the burrows uh, and load the ammunition into our packs and carry them <laughs> on the rest of the way. Uh, <clears throat> the back to uh, Mo Monte Cassino. Monte Cassino. Okay, we're going oh. to stop again. Mm -hmm. Ralph Woolard is the veteran of World War II who is talking about his experiences and he is going to continue talking about Monte Cassino. <clears throat> Monte Cassino Abbey uh, again was a very highly debated matter. Most of the men in my company who were Catholic, felt that we should try to destroy that abbey. They said, men first and structures later. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in a lot of political pressure from uh, the Vatican, for example, uh, that wanted it uh, saved. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, that went back and forth, and finally General Eisenhower made the decision as to what should happen. But before I get to that, I relate 
one event that took place on the casino front that uh, cost us our uh, battalion commander. Uh, it was early on in my experience with the 36th. But it had direct relationship to the 36th, uh, or to the uh, uh, casino because of their the positions that the Germans had. The Germans always were able to fall back into prepared positions. They had slave labor that built great fortifications and uh, holds for their men to uh, get down in and uh, with uh, well-protected rooftops over these holes. Well, it, <coughs> I, was, I hadn't been in the division more than 10, 12 days. It was early in January. And uh, we received notice that uh, we were to do some adjustment in our lines, the disposition of these units. And we were to uh, move a couple of miles over and uh, replace a unit that... Uh, we, we thought it was an American unit. We, uh, uh, the whole battalion was to move. So we uh, got over to the area that uh, we felt uh, we were to occupy and found out that a French unit had occupied it two days before. That was, uh, they had just been placed there and uh, couldn't understand why they were to be moved. They hadn't received any uh, notices. Well, obviously, it was a, a mistake somewhere, someplace. And uh, we referred earlier to the polyglot of uh, different peoples who were in the Italian campaign. Japanese Americans, for example, the best fighting unit in the whole war the most highly decorated. They were on the front there. Uh, not particularly at this particular thing I'm talking about now, but there they were. The New Zealanders, the British, the Free French, elements of the French Foreign Legion, New Zealanders, the Polish, Sikhs from North Africa, mm -hmm. goons from, or Sikhs from India, and goons from North Africa. They were Arabs, really who loved to go out on patrol and come back with, as they used to say, with German ears. Uh, they were, they loved their knives. Well, what to do? We didn't know what to do. We, uh, the uh, battalion commander uh, signaled out, or uh, said, uh, Lieutenant Hashmeyer, you get a couple of your fellows from the uh, intelligence squad, and uh, we're going to go down and talk to somebody in the French unit if we can find them. So I was one of the persons chosen uh, to go down. Now, Lieutenant Hashmeyer, you'll hear of him later also, was a fellow from uh, near Macomb, Illinois. He was about uh, 28, 29, college graduate. He was our S2 or intelligence uh, unit uh, leader. Of course, uh, uh, we liked him very much. He was an old farm boy. Uh, but we took off with the battalion commander. We found a French officer, a platoon uh, lieutenant, who could speak passable uh, English. And uh, he said, well, we've just, you know, just got here. I, mean, I have no reason to want to move. We don't have orders to move. Uh, and uh, our battalion commander asked, well, where is your commander? He said, well, I think it might be down the road a kilometer or two. There's a little hamlet down there. Now, we were in total, almost total darkness. It was very dark. And I'm happy for it. Uh, so we uh, went down the uh, 
road, our troops had been instructed to get into a large uh, grove of uh, olive trees, and uh, this would hide them from the Germans. And uh, they simply, uh, the uh, uh, troops just took a rest while all this was going on. And uh, the commander uh, and all of us went down to this hamlet. We searched through, didn't find a soul. We stepped out of the back door of the last house we were in and uh, walked a few feet and noticed barbed wire. Rolls of it on, went on as far as we could see. And a little sign on it that uh, we knew the word, German word for minefield. And this was a minefield uh, of the Germans and that they had affected and we were on the wrong side of it. And uh, we uh, knew that uh, we shouldn't be there. We didn't have the manpower to be there at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, tried to beat a hasty retreat. We went back through the houses. We uh, uh, stepped out of the house, gone maybe 25 or 30 feet, when the first shell from an 88 millimeter anti-tank gun hit the road in front of us. And then a few seconds later, the second one. Uh, the uh, battalion commander says, uh, I'm hit. And uh, we grabbed him. We uh, ran back to the house with him. That was the closest shelter we could find. Uh, <clears throat> ran back to the house. We got there. He was still talking. We could tell that he had a very serious wound. And uh, he said, my bowels have to move. Can you help me? Uh, well, we took his uh, pistol belt. He wore a pistol. And we took the pistol belt and got his pants down, got him into a squatting position. His uh, uh, pants and underwear were full of blood. As we got him into a position, he fell back and died. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was nothing more that we could do for him. We, uh, Lieutenant Hashmar, uh, radioed up to battalion and uh, asked for a stretcher and two stretcher bearers. And uh, despite the danger of the situation, well, they came down and uh, got the uh, commander. And uh, we all, there was no more shelling. Fortunately, we went back up to the battalion. By this time, uh, a new battalion commander, the second in charge, had assumed the role. We still didn't have any word from the regiment as, or the division as to what had gone wrong and where we were, what was going to become of us. And uh, so the new uh, battalion commander said, take me back to the French lieutenant. We, I want to talk to him. We took him back there. The lieutenant, uh, French lieutenant said, uh, I have a patrol out. I'm worried about them. They're overdue. Mm -hmm. uh, and about that time, we heard an explosion. Now, we knew enough. That, well, Sergeant Smith had told me what to listen for. And, and uh, I knew by the, uh, knew that it was either a hand grenade or a landmine because there was no incoming sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed it was uh, a landmine and uh, the French patrol had uh, encountered it and one of their members was hurt. And uh, they had fallen to the ground and just kind of froze. They were afraid to take steps. and But then the Germans started throwing mortar shells in on that uh, sound that they had heard there. And uh, the uh, French patrol had nothing they could do but get up and run, and run toward uh, 
uh, to get to their own lines, callously leaving the wounded man in the, in the minefield and in the barbed wire. Well, fortunately, two very brave French medics went in and got him. And uh, I saw him when he came out. His foot was blown off a few inches above the ankle and uh, completely off. So uh, we, uh, uh, there wasn't much use talking anymore with the French lieutenant. He had his own problems. So we went back up to our battalion headquarters up there among the trees. By this time, we had word from the regiment that there had been a mistake. And uh, we uh, were to remain in position in that, at Grove overnight. And then we were told to how to, uh, where to move out to. We uh, bedded down about 6 o'clock the next morning. Uh, we were rolling up our blankets, getting ready to depart, when we heard a uh, loud noise, a, like a rumbling. And uh, looking down onto this road that led down to the hamlet, well, coming from a friendly direction was three huge wooden wagons, and they were laden with uh, ammunition, and uh, with food for the French forces. Each wagon was pulled by four horses. And uh, they were in, uh, they were on, on this road, way across the valley, directly ahead of them, were Germans who were looking at this. And uh, within just a minute, the artillery began to rain on these horses and the men driving them. It was a horrendous, a horrible scene. The, uh, not, nothing escaped. The, uh, the men were killed. The horses that were not killed immediately were walking around, slipping and sliding on their own entrails. And uh, our first sergeant, that uh, I've told you about, he was probably the f closest man to the, those wagons. And uh, he always carried a Thompson submachine gun. And uh, he went down to the edge of the uh, grove of olive trees. And using that uh, gun, he dispatched the horses that weren't already dead. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, uh, only the French could get involved. It was so stupid of them. Uh, you know, I just have to say that. Uh, it was so apparent that if anyone mm -hmm. was there, they could know to stay off that road in the daytime. And nighttime, you have to take some chances, but well, we, uh, under a new commander, he led us out, uh, avoiding stepping out on the road. We kept in an olive grove all the way out and behind a hill where we couldn't be seen, and we moved to uh, a different position. Was, but uh, those were two days in January that I mm -hmm. won't forget. And. Uh, <clears throat> Now back to Monte Cassino Abbey. Can you do me a favor and set down that green folder for me? Thank you. Thank you, Father. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> Monte Cassino Abbey is still on my mind here. And uh, uh, we had uh, reduced the city of Cassino to nothing but rebel. We had just pulverized it, but indeed it had only made the city stronger, the German troops that were there. There were a few of them killed, yes, but uh, big concrete slabs were blown up and there were uh, 
the soldiers could get under those slabs and uh, be protected from mm -hmm. small arms fire. So all these different troops tried getting into uh, casino. You know, they would get maybe to the outskirts, and then Germans would throw them back. Um, the Germans and uh, the German troops in Italy were very, very good troops. We underestimated what they were. And they were, as I said, led by Marshal Kesselring, who was probably one of the most able of the commanders. Uh, then the decision uh, was made to try, let the Americans try to get into casino. And uh, this involved a very complicated maneuver of uh, crossing the Rapido River that ran through the valley. And we were, it made all kinds of S turns. And uh, um, in preparation for that, we were sent some rubber boats as, that uh, you could put into the water and uh, some paddles to get across the uh, river. In. And we were down at uh, way uh, to the east of or west of uh, Casino, and we hoped that to get, getting across the river there, we could come in from the west, and uh, uh, while well, some other troops were tracking, attacking from the other side. So uh, this was a uh, wild uh, idea by uh, the uh, general who was in charge of the Fifth Army. And uh, he's become rather infamous among Texans, who blame him <laughs> for a good many things. But uh, he wasn't uh, the most able man. But at any rate, uh, the 143rd uh, Infantry or Regiment was given the job of crossing, first of all. We would cross at midnight. Uh, the 143rd would cross. Then the 141st, uh, well, the 143rd would establish a, a, beer, uh, 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 a position. Then the, the next regiment would come through and push on beyond that. And then our division would come through last, or our uh, regiment would come through last. Uh, it never got to our regiment. Uh, the uh, terrific... Uh, gunfire from Germans. They uh, leveled every piece of artillery they had on uh, the Rapido River area. The fragmentation cut the uh, rubber boats, just sliced it. Mm -hmm. They would fill with water and sink. And uh, there they were with a paddle and no boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you could just wade across the, r the river. Uh, the fighting went on two days. The, they never established a large enough foothold for my regiment to come in and, mm -hmm. and uh, finish the work. So uh, at the end of two days of fighting, the Germans asked for a truce. And I think it was the only truce in World War II. Mm -hmm. Uh, to pick up the dead and the wounded. We granted that because we wanted to do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the truce was to last about four hours. The Germans asked for an extension on the time. Uh, our uh, leaders said, no, we can't have, the, but they did give them another half hour or something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, well, I was not... Uh, there uh, to do that, to help with that, the, uh, they brought in a lot of medics to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the German soldiers and American soldiers exchanged cigarettes and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Rather surreal events, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, was, I believe, the only truce in World War II. Well, uh, 
we lost about 1,800 men in that engagement, killed and wounded. It was a terrific uh, battle. All right, uh, the sentiment grew to do away with the Monte Cassino Abbey. Uh, my division, the 36th, was pulled off the line before uh, the abbey was destroyed. Mm -hmm. We were pulled off to go to Anzio. Now, uh, I've seen pictures of the destroying of the abbey, and of course, it took uh, these. We took sent in our big bombers, the B-25s, and so on, and they just blew it off the mountain mm -hmm. in a few hours. I've been a casino since then. Uh, it's been beautifully restored. Uh, but by most estimates, and most, most people believe now that the Germans never used it as an observation post. Mm. No one ever saw a German soldier run out of the place when it was bombed. So it was probably a mistake. Yet psychologically, it was a big boost. It was a big boost to our troops. They said, hooray, now we can go and get casino. Well, it wasn't, wasn't that easy. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, I said we were pulled off the line to go to Anzio. Now, the military, the military brass, knew that we were really bogged down at Casino. Well, you know, we can't get out of here. Uh, we can't advance toward Rome and on up uh, this boot that uh, constitutes Italy. We, uh, the uh, idea was to have an invasion north of the German lines. That German line ran all the way across Italy. So we, here's the German boot. We were here at uh, Anzio, and, uh, or I'm sorry, here at Casino, and uh, we were down here. We thought if we can get a, uh, flotilla of boats and invade north of the German line, we could cut off the Germans and cut off their supply routes and it uh, wouldn't be long before we would have them. And uh, two divisions, the 45th Infantry Division, which is an Oklahoma division, uh, and I believe the 3rd Division, were uh, assigned to in, uh, go in at Anzio. Anzio was a little town along the Itali Italian coast on the east uh, uh, west side. Uh, we uh, thought there would be a cakewalk and uh, we, we could trap the Germans. And uh, we got aboard. We got into Anzio, the city, fairly easily. But the Germans sensed what we were doing, and they uh, put a ring of steel, so to speak, of German divisions around that city of Anzio. Uh, not the city itself, but on the mountains behind uh, the, the city of Anzio. And as we moved in, we met this what we called a ring of steel. We just uh, uh, found that they were tougher than we had anticipated. And we just got bogged down. Uh, and that was the reason for pulling the 36th Infantry Division off the casino line, get putting them on boats and going into Anzio and have them lead in a breakthrough, a breakout Mm. And this ring of steel. Mm. So we got there and uh, we took positions. 
Uh, <clears throat> pause here for just a moment. Uh, I noticed one thing as I walked into the city of Anzio and uh, the outskirts. We had established hospital there for the wounded. And uh, to establish a hospital, we uh, the uh, uh, engineers had uh, dug huge holes uh, so that uh, about four feet deep, and it maybe be uh, 80 or 90 feet across and 80 or 90 feet long. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you walked around this, and this only your head showed above mm -hmm. the uh, embankments. And uh, there were nurses, women, who were working in there. And uh, I have to give credit to the uh, Army nurses. Uh, they did a terrific job under sometimes very dangerous conditions. That uh, hospital, <coughs> excuse me, hospital was under, uh, well within artillery range. And uh, uh, they carried on and they carried on very, very well. So I pay tribute to, to them. Oh, we're going to change tapes? Okay. We are talking with Ralph Wagner Woolard, and we are now going to be talking about his experiences in Anzio during World War II. <clears throat> I was speaking of the nurses and the very remarkable job they did under very difficult circumstances. And uh, I have nothing but praise for them. They were skilled and uh, they were also uh, courageous. Uh, right, our job uh, as uh, 36th Infantry was to break through uh, in uh, early May the uh, this ring of steel around uh, the An town of Anzio and then another town called Velletri. Uh, <clears throat> then my uh, regiment did a very unusual thing. Uh, the 143rd and 141st regiments were assigned to attack the mountains that the Germans were on all around us. And the 142nd, my regiment, uh, one night found a gap in the German line, meaning there were no soldiers there for some reason. And in the middle of the night, we infiltrated uh, through that line an entire regiment of people and up even higher on the mountains than the Germans. Mm. We were uh, uh, well arranged. We spread ourselves out, knowing where the spearhead was to be, and uh, waited for the attack to come. And we would, as we hoped the Germans would be chased up the hill to where we were, mm -hmm. we would be waiting for them. Well, <clears throat> my squad, as it usually was, was all alone for some reason. Now, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't unusual for the uh, intelligence squad to be on its own because we had a different work most of the time than other squads had. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Lieutenant Hashmeyer from Macomb, Illinois, and... Uh, there were seven, uh, seven or eight of us who were still active. And, uh, we were trying to make some coffee. And uh, when the attack had started, we knew that probably it would be a little while before the Germans came up the hill. And, uh, but all of a sudden, we heard somebody moving in the bushes and the trees on down the hill. And... Uh, We thought, well, it's not nothing. Uh, it's not uh, an American 
troop or organization of any kind has to be German. So Lieutenant Hashmeyer took charge and he said, spread yourselves out, we're going down to meet them. And uh, Hashmeyer was on my immediate right, about 15 feet, and the rest of the squad was out to the left. And uh, we started marching down to the marching or moving down to the trees. And uh, there was a crack of a, whis of a pistol. I knew it wasn't a rifle, it was just a pistol crack. And Hashmar was hit, mm. hit his, and uh, knocked him down. And then the fellow, the German who had fired the pistol, jumped up immediately, threw his pistol down and said, Comrade, there uh, is a problem sometimes. I think American troops uh, conduct themselves and deport themselves better than most troops in the world. Uh, they have more compassion. And, uh, you know, you, you have problems that way every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, by and large, they're pretty good about handling prisoners. But in an instance like that, the emotions are extremely, you know, they're mm -hmm. rock high. And the anger is there as well. Uh, Hashmar was well liked, and uh, they, you know you run into those instances like that occasionally, and what happens? Sometimes, uh, sometimes it ends one way, and sometimes it ends another. Mm -hmm. But Hashmar. Uh, we had to uh, get a stretcher for him and uh, took him on back. Well, we, we waited uh, for a little while till some of the units came up the hill, unfortunately, some American units where we were, and uh, took charge of uh, Hashmar. Hashmar died on his way to the... Mm -hmm. uh, First aid station, however. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, was uh, really a sad day for our group. The uh, in fact, I'm going to come back to one other instance. Uh, I meant to tell about it. This, if you don't mind my backing up a Not moment. Not at all. Uh, this was at Casino. We were at the top of a mountain in a little hamlet, uh, 10 or 12 houses. It was on a Sunday, and along comes our, our minister. Uh, I'd, I'd seen him before uh, a couple of times. He was a guy without a lot of education. He was a Baptist. And uh, uh, about 45 years of age. And uh, he would sometimes hold a service. But here he was up at the top of this mountain. And we were being shelled furiously. And uh, he went from house to house and he says, Boys, I'm going to have a service. It's going to be across the street in that house. And they said, if you want to come, come ahead. Well, seven or eight of us went over there. And uh, he took off his helmet, threw it on the ground. He says, boys, I'm ready to go. I, I feel comfortable. Uh, I'm ready to meet my maker. Well, most of us weren't quite ready. So we kept our helmets on, 
but and I don't remember what he said. But the fact that uh, he didn't have to be there. Uh, he could have been in the valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was too old to be walking around the mountains anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never saw him again. So I don't know what happened to him. Uh, also, uh, one more story on the casino front. And then I'll come back to Anzio again. But uh, we were to do a, uh, an attack on a German position. The attack was to begin at midnight. This is, of course, in Italy. And uh, it was in uh, late, late January. Uh, there was a man in the company who was in what we call the Pioneer Platoon, who were engineers, really. And uh, he was from Chicago. His name was Joe Ecosiatic. A very quiet man. If there was ever a man out of place in the Army, it was Joe. Never talked much, and uh, for some reason he took a liking to me. He, he'd come over and talk to me when we when we could. Well, well our attack began at uh, midnight and we were along with the uh, all the others. And we'd met machine gun fire all the way up the hill. Just terrific machine gun. Every time we'd move and uh, uh, we'd hit a rock and it'd roll down the mountain. Why, although the Germans couldn't see any better than we could, mm -hmm. they nevertheless fired in the direction of uh, the noises. And then uh, it got so intense that the German artillery fired right in on its own positions mm -hmm. because we were intermingled with them. And their positions were so protected that they could withstand some of their own artillery, mm -hmm. where we were out in a flat open. Uh, uh, we were flattened out on the ground there for a minute or two, undergoing a lot of machine gun fire, and suddenly Joe was at my side. Now, he should have been with his platoon. I said, Joe, you're in the wrong place. You, you need to be with your platoon. He didn't say anything. But then there was a rip of uh, machine gun. And I could feel the impact of it hitting Joe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the sparks right in front of my nose. I was flat. And uh, sparks off the bullets uh, hitting the rock. Uh, I could see. And I heard Joe moan. He didn't talk. And uh, we uh, got the word to continue the attack. I sent word back by someone behind me. He said, tell the medics that Joe's up here and he's wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, we continued the attack. Uh, I ran forward, found uh, a little animal shed of some sort that I was trying to snuggle around and uh, found out I was nothing, nothing more than dried manure that I was in. And, uh, but then a word came to fall back. It's useless. We're not going to get through. Go back to the base of the mountain from which, where we started. And uh, down the hill we went. I got down to the hill and I said, uh, did anybody see Joe? Or did they bring him down? Nobody seemed to know anything about him. So uh, Sergeant, uh, first sergeant, said, Ralph, uh, you know where he is. You and uh, take a couple other guys, see if you can go get him. You, know, you try not to leave your wounded. So we started back up the hill again, machine gun fire. And uh, we got to Joe. He was still alive. 
uh, took, put him on a stretcher and went down to the base of the hill uh, looking for a first aid uh, station. And uh, we were carrying him, so that uh, the four of us by that time carrying him. And, uh, and we got ma uh, machine pistol fire. The Germans in mm -hmm. had infiltrated our line and were firing. And they hit, uh, hit one of the stretcher carriers through the shoulder. And, uh, but we weren't too far from an aid station. We got there. Joe died in a couple of hours. Mm. But uh, uh, again, he was one of those people who just a total misfit in the army. This was so alien to him, this, things like this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, that was uh, things that happened on the casino front. Well, at Anzio, uh, the breakthrough came. Our division uh, broke out of that ring of steel. But General Mark Clark, who was a general of the Fifth Army, uh, American Army in Italy, decided <coughs> that a little piece of glory should come his way. And uh, instead of cutting across uh, from east or from west to east and trapping the Germans who were in Casino, Mark Clark said, we're going to Rome. Mm. He turned and up the coastal highways to Rome. And uh, about 70 to 80,000 German soldiers were able to escape uh, back up the peninsula mm. to fight again. Mm. It was, it was a bad mistake, mm -hmm. and uh, General Clark got great pictures of himself walking into Rome with the pistol on his hip, and uh, it was. Was that realized at the time? Beg your pardon. Did, was that realized at the time that that was a mistake and that uh, uh, so many Germans escaped? It was. Uh, it was by mm -hmm. uh, most people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. He should have been demoted. I think he got a real tongue lashing from Eisenhower, from what I've heard, but, mm -hmm. uh, what I've read. And he <clears throat> he was came back to the after the war was over, and he became a commandant for the uh, for a boys' military school mm -hmm. on the East Coast. No. When you were engaged in these battles, did you understand what the overall strategy was? Were you, or uh, a lot of times we did, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, a lot of times we did. There were there were other times when we were absolutely in the dark mm -hmm. and uh, wondering what in the world are we doing, and. Uh, uh, it just depends on the uh, situation uh, and how able some of our regimental commanders were in gleaning some information mm -hmm. from uh, uh, other sources. But uh, we got to up toward uh, Rome. And uh, here again, we had a most unusual circumstance. Uh, we had been fighting uh, south of Rome, uh, another division called the Bicycle Division. It was a German division that traveled on bicycle. Hmm. Unusual. And uh, we had pretty well routed them, and they retreated to a point north. We. Uh, they left a lot of equipment around, including a lot of bicycles. <laughs> we were at a rest for a day or two, uh, gather our forces and then go on toward Rome. So our fellows had gotten some of these bicycles and they were having <laughs> fun. 
uh, riding around on the bicycles. They were also using some of the German tents and uh, uh, other kinds of German equipment. And all of a sudden, down comes a squadron of fighter planes. And they looked down and they saw some troops on the bicycle. Oh. And now this was a squadron of called the Tuxi, uh, Tuskegee Airmen. They were black uh, airmen. They were probably the best, uh, best fighting uh, fighter plane units in the army. They never lost a plane, uh, a bomber. They escorted bombers. But they could only go so far with bombers because they didn't have the fuel tanks. So they'd escort them a certain distance, and then they'd fly back and uh, land and mm -hmm. wait for the uh, bombers to come back part way, and then they'd meet them again and es escort them on home. But uh, they looked down and uh, saw these guys on bicycles. And they knew that they had the <coughs> the bicycle division. It had to be them. Mm -hmm. So they came down and strafed us. Oh wow! Fifty caliber machine guns. Two, uh, two of uh, the planes. The third plane recognized what was going on. He radioed the others. We only lost one man. Thank, mm. thank goodness. Uh, but the next day, up came these. Uh, flyers, the Tuskegee Airmen, and they came up and uh, wanted to apologize for the mistake they'd mm -hmm. made. Now we'd been strafed by airplanes before our own. Mm -hmm. With my first day in the unit on, in, uh, with uh, the 25th of <laughs> December, mm -hmm. we'd been strafed by American planes. First time I'd been shot at. And uh, <coughs> for some, in this instance, we only lost the one man. But never did anybody come up and, and uh, apologize for the mm -hmm. mistake, but these guys did. Mm -hmm. Last year, here at the University of Illinois, the Tuskegee Airmen, what's left of them, mm -hmm. came here for a meeting. And I got to tell them about oh. the strafing incident. So it was... Uh, Kind of a nice meeting. There, are, uh, there are five or six of them left. Mm -hmm. There, uh, they had to be college graduates. Mm -hmm. That was a distinction they made uh, uh, for the uh, uh, black uh, uh, pilots. The other pilots didn't have to be college trained, but they put this kind of a barrier up there. Mm -hmm. Well, these guys uh, were great. Uh, airmen. They never lost a bomber. So <clears throat> it's kind of a side issue mm -hmm. just south of Rome. Rome, we were on the edge of Rome the night of the June 4th. My division was right on the outskirts. We would go in uh, either on the 5th or the 6th. And there had been an agreement that Rome would not be fought over. Somehow, mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the Vatican perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, through scholars who said, save this, mm -hmm. uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't fought over. And, uh, but, uh, I don't know whether I should tell this or not, but Again, I was with the Texas Division, and they were having quite a party south of Rome. They'd gotten some wine from someplace. Well, a couple of other fellows, and uh, we decided that we'd like to see a little bit of Rome. And uh, there wasn't anyone, no one was watching the chicken coop. <laughs> so we got into a jeep, and we went up the edge of Rome, the outskirts, to some streets, drove around a little bit, didn't see a soul. The street, the buildings were shuttered tight. The, 
and uh, we uh, thought about that for a little while and said, you know, this may not be the best place for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we left and got, went back to our unit, mm -hmm. and uh, we made an unauthorized visit to Rome. But the next, uh, we, uh, we really occupied Rome on June 6th, mm -hmm. which was my birthday on 1940. Uh, then Rome, you were tw Rome, 20 years old? I was uh, uh, 20. Yes. Mm -hmm. The uh, Roman citizens had their shutters open. There were thousands of them on the street, just cheering and clapping. And at 5.30 in the morning or 6 o'clock, I was walking right by the Roman Colosseum, mm -hmm. something I'd read about all my life. Mm -hmm. There it was. And uh, I'll never forget one Italian f gentleman yelling at us from the curb. He says, it is good that you are looking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we didn't stop in Rome. We went right through. Mm. We met resistance uh, a few miles north, some initial resistance, and then uh, on to Magliano, uh, Italy, a town of about thirty or forty thousand people, and uh, we were going to attack that town. This uh, would have been about the twelfth, uh, thirteenth of June, mm -hmm. and uh, we were waiting for the tanks to catch up with us. And the tanks were going to help us as we attacked this town. Uh, our first sergeant uh, asked uh, me and another member of the uh, uh, of our squad, a fellow by the name of Waylon Dawes, uh, to go out to the, the road that the tanks would be coming up and direct the tanks into the uh, olive, an olive grove that we were mm -hmm. trying to hide in. And all the Germans pretty well knew we were there. So he said, uh, uh, first sergeant says, go out to this gate, wait there. We got out there and we met, were met by machine gun fire. We, kn we knew that it was uh, some distance away and wasn't too worried about it because there was a big stone fence that we could get behind. And we knew that uh, those bullets were pretty well spent by the time they got to this stone fence. So we just plopped ourselves down on the ground, waited for the tanks. And uh, the tanks uh, didn't come, and they didn't come. And finally, uh, I guess the uh, Germans finally figured out that uh, I and Wayland Dawes were at this point, and they threw in two rounds, two martyr rounds, mm -hmm. and uh, we were both wounded. Dawes was hit in the knee pretty bad. Eventually, he got to go home. Uh, I was hit uh, just generally all over. From the head, I had a piece go through my helmet, mm -hmm. lodged there, about here but fortunately not to the skull. And uh, I hit in the armpit, uh, buttocks, legs, uh, ankles, soles of my feet. Mm. <laughs> uh, the worst wound was uh, in his left leg. I lost a lot of muscle uh, from it. And uh, it's still a problem area. But uh, uh, first aid came quickly. We, uh, the Germans decided not to throw any more mortars. Hmm. And uh, we were put into an ambulance at some point. We were taken to a field hospital and uh, then on down to uh, Anzio to another hospital, and from Anzio we flew out to Naples, hmm. 
to uh, another field hospital in a tent. And uh, there we had major surgery done to remove pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I was in that hospital for about three and a half weeks, four weeks. And uh, then uh, got out and was sent to a reconditioning camp. And uh, that was on my way back to my own unit.